Today, uh, which is Friday, October 14th, I'm actually going to make two videos and I'm going to post them both one right after the other. The first one is going to try to catch us up to date on what's been going on in the war in Ukraine, some really important developments over the last couple of weeks um, that increasingly have been leading to this question about potential nuclear weapons use. And so in the second video, um, I'm going to really dig into detail about uh, how you might actually use nuclear weapons on the battlefield in Ukraine uh, and, and, what this, uh, and, and what it would mean or what it might result in. So first, um, what's going on in the war over the last couple of weeks? Um, the big picture is that Russia is struggling to hold territory on the ground. Uh, of late, in the last week or so, the most important action has been in the south of Ukraine, around Kherson. Uh, but of course, over the past few weeks, Ukraine has gained a great deal of territory in, uh, in uh, sort of north, uh, northeastern Ukraine in uh, Luhansk Oblast and in Kharkiv Oblast. So um, on basically on several different fronts, um, the Ukrainians are slowly but surely making progress. And yesterday, uh, the local occupation authorities in Kherson uh, essentially uh, um, advised the people in Kherson that they consider to be Russians um, to evacuate the area because basically uh, they're not sure that they can protect them anymore. Um, but um, in... in, in at the same time, Russia has been attacking Ukraine's cities. They call this retaliation for Ukraine's, uh, what we assume was Ukraine's anyhow, a quite spectacular attack on the Kerch Straits Bridge last week. Um, now, retaliation is, is a word we really shouldn't use. It's um, in the sense of, you know, Ukraine somehow started something. Um, but that's how Russia presents it, right? You attacked our territory, so we're going to attack you, leaving aside, of course, the fact that Russia has been attacking Ukraine uh, for six months now. Um, but the point is this, is that at this point, Russia um, is struggling to uh, to hold territory uh, at the front between the two forces. It's struggling to win the battle on the ground. So really all it can do instead is try to damage Ukraine cities. This is really what's, what's often uh, in military terms called a counter value strategy rather than a counter force strategy. You can't de de defeat the forces, so you attack things of value, hoping simply to coerce them uh, into stopping to, to limit those costs. Uh, history tends to show that that counter force, I'm sorry, that counter value strategy, bombing the other side cities, uh, tends not actually to work. So from World War II, for example, we have uh, the cases of Germany uh, bombing London. We have the cases of uh, the uh, British and American air forces bombing large parts of Germany. And of course, um, the American uh, air forces bombing Japan, um, in, in bef even before the nuclear weapons, right? The United States used incendiary weapons uh, to basically burn the entire city of Tokyo. The, the lesson from all of those cases was that bombing civilians in cities can kill a lot of people, can make a lot of people miserable, can create a lot of refugees, but what it doesn't do is convince people that they want to stop fighting. In fact, uh, quite the opposite happened in all of these cases, right? It, uh, the, the, the terror and the anger uh, from being attacked, from innocent people being killed um, indiscriminately uh, um, increased the states involved will to fight the war. Um, and so far, this is what we've seen in Ukraine as well. I might also point to Vietnam, where the United States dumped more uh, munitions on Vietnam than it had dumped uh, in all of World War II. And the effect uh, was not what the United States intended, which was that eventually the Vietnamese would decide that the cost of fighting this war was too high. Uh, rather, what the North Vietnamese decided was that it was that much more important uh, that, that, um, that they defeat this what they saw as an invader. So... Um, as Ukraine gains more and more ground on the front, Russia kills more and more innocent Ukrainians behind the front lines, right? Um, this, is, this is basically what we, would, in another context, would call terrorism, right? You're killing innocent people as a way of trying to uh, get their leaders to do something different. Um, whatever it is that you, that you call it, it doesn't seem to be working. So the big questions then are, um, first of all, how long can Russia do this for? This gets to this question of how many uh, of the missiles that they're using for these kind of, of long-range strikes, how many do they have? And I don't have precise numbers, unfortunately, 
Uh, but, but sources that I trust say, you know, for the time being, they can do a lot more of this, but their resources are not infinite. And in fact, there's already signs that they're using um, older, uh, less accurate missiles because they are running short of the really accurate ones. So one of the things that's happening in this war on both sides, of course, is that the key weapons um, are beginning to run out. And, and so that's one question is, even if this is what Russia's strategy is, uh, how long can it maintain that strategy? But the other question, of course, um, is what happens if Ukraine continues to win the war at the front even while Russia uh, attacks Ukraine cities. And, and to be honest with you, you know, that's what's been happening over the last week, which is R Russia's blowing up cities, but Ukraine is, is uh, gaining territory. Uh, Russia hopes that its mobilization will, will turn the tide. And one variation, uh, there's a lot of speculation about what Russia is going to do with these new troops. One, uh, one speculation that I've seen um, from a Ukrainian source, um, so it's speculation, but it makes sense, um, is that is that Russia would would put a, a lot of troops in Belarus, and of course, I shouldn't say of course. You may not know this. Um, the Russian, uh, the Belarusian president uh, Alexander Lukashenko announced this week that there would be new deployments of Russian troops in Belarus. So it's a hint that this idea of of new troops in Belarus is a serious thing. So perhaps there will be a new attack in on the north of Ukraine uh, with new troops uh, coming down from Belarus. There was, of course, some of that at the beginning of the war, and, and, and those troops didn't actually succeed very well. But at this point, what that would force is it would force Ukraine, presumably, to divert forces from other places in order to fight back against that new attack in the north, and that might weaken those forces elsewhere enough uh, to, to stop them in their tracks or maybe e even give Russia a chance uh, to, to begin taking territory back. Uh, that is all pretty hypothetical at that point. Um, so if we get back to the, 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 the question, just to repeat it, even as Russia shoots conventionally armed missiles at Ukrainian cities, um, if Ukraine continues to make gains on the ground, what does Russia do? And at that point, Russia essentially has, has two options. One is to sort of accept that loss of, 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 of territory, that it's, of course, it's not Russian territory anyhow, um, but sort of to accept that those losses or to escalate. And when we talk uh, about escalating, of course, um, we talk about um, escalating to, to the use of, of nuclear weapons. Um, so the, I'm going to get to that in a, in a second video, but just to bring this one together, um, there is this, I, I think of it as strange, but in terms of 20th century warfare and now 20th century warfare, it's not really strange at all, which is you're doing two different things. You're trying to defeat the enemy's forces, on the battlefield, and you're trying to do things beyond the battlefield that make the enemy say, I, um, the cost of this war is too high, uh, I, we've got to find a way to stop it, we've got to negotiate a peace. Some of that, of course, is blowing up Ukrainian cities. Um, some of it is also things like economic sanctions. Um, so that's the situation we're getting at now. And, and again, just to repeat the key question, if things go like they've been going, um, Vladimir Putin and the Russian leadership are getting put in a much, much, much more difficult position, which is either they have to accept a defeat that they've said they won't accept, or they have to escalate in a way which uh, would be quite, I think, unpredictable in its consequences and potentially catastrophic. So uh, I'm going to stop there, um, but there will be, a, a, like I said, a second video that I'm going to make in a few minutes that will get at that question of how do you, if Russia did decide to use nuclear weapons, how would it do that? What would this look like? How would it change the war? And what might be the implications?